The third book is a short story anthology, and it's basically my take on love and how I view love. And uh, all these stories took place in the city of Buffalo, so we called it Buffalo Stories. And I'll just read a little bit of uh, one of my favorites from the anthology. It's called That Summer at Charlie's. The amazing thing was that any of us survived that summer, but some of us did. And looking back on it, we wondered how we would have been naive enough to think that in Seaver's case, good would triumph over evil. It turned out to be an unusually hot and humid summer for Buffalo with little rain. We had no air conditioning in the apartment above Charlie's. Charlie's was a bar on Niagara Street, not far from the Niagara River. The building was three stories tall, and we lived on the third floor, affording us access to the roof, where Jilly set up a blow-up swimming pool and chairs. Charlie gave her a hard time about it at first, but eventually the old man gave up and even sat in the water himself sometimes. The first day we'd set up the pool, we'd haul buckets of water up the stairs to the roof one at a time. Seaver deemed it backbreaking and obnoxious. Nora agreed, claiming there had to be a better way. Ricky came up with one. Ricky was our resident handyman. He could fix anything. Even Charlie took advantage of his skills. Anyway, Ricky took himself down to the local hardware store and came back with a hose. He ran the hose from our kitchen faucet to the roof, and from then on, filling the pool was a breeze. Ricky, Ricky also rigged up a dark room, which I used often. Nora said I was always stinking up the apartment with chemicals and probably when she was 50 she could cancer it from them and die. I ignored her. Nora was the paranoid one. Just to piss her off, I told her it was because her father was Puerto Rican. She told me that that made absolutely no sense and to shut up. Our apartment was a rambling, mismatched affair of garage sale furniture, exposed duct work, and flaking paint. Charlie told us if we wanted to paint the place, we could, and he'd deduct the paint from the rent. There were two bedrooms and two bathrooms, one now being my dark room. Jilly and Nora shared one room. Ricky and Seaver shared the other. Seaver got a kick out of the fact that he shared a room with Ricky. Shit, he'd say, slapping his thigh. Could you imagine what my father would say if he knew I slept in the same room as a black man? Then he'd laugh like a maniac. Seaver was a blonde, blue-eyed dream, a student at Buff State who hailed from Atlanta, Georgia. I loved his accent. Nobody said y'all quite like Seaver. I slept on the living room couch. Last in gets the couch, Jilly said the day I moved in. Jilly was beautiful. She had auburn hair, fair freckled skin, emerald eyes, and a gently angled face. Her hair hung in shiny waves around her shoulders. She favored faded, frayed blue jeans and tank tops in summer, bulky wool sweaters in winter. I'd known Jilly since childhood. I'd loved her since puberty. She had perfect, just the right size breasts. I wanted to hold them in my hands. I wanted to suck on them. I wanted to take her to bed. Jilly didn't know that I loved her. Jilly didn't know I was gay. I'd never had the guts to tell her. Besides, I'd been in Chicago and she'd been here in Buffalo. But I'd moved back. I'd missed my hometown. I'd missed Jilly. Jilly made a living with her pottery. Of course, I'm sure her monthly allowance from the trust fund her grandmother had left her helped with the bills. She'd set up her potter's wheel by a wide, high window that looked out on Niagara Street, and I loved to watch her create. She'd laugh at me. Don't you have anything better to do, she'd ask. Nope, I'd respond. She was incredibly sexy when she worked at the wheel. Hands covered with clay, arm muscles working, her face set in concentration. I loved her firm, broad shoulders. Nora was a psychologist. She worked in one of the city's free clinics. She felt it was her debt to society, excuse me, debt to, to society to never get rich off of other people's problems. I thought she was nuts. I told her to set up an office and charge $150 per hour. She told me to shut up and mind my own business. I never was really sure where it was that Ricky worked. All I knew was that he left early every weekday morning, bagged lunch in hand, and came home after five. Seaver said he fixed things for people. 
I let it go at that. The day that Seaver took his last final exam, he came home with a case of beer, sat on the living room couch, and got drunk. He was on his eighth beer when I came out of the dark room. I developed some prints I'd shot in Delaware Park. He was sprawled on the couch, bare feet on the glass coffee table, jeans unbuttoned and unzipped, white shirt unbuttoned, his chest covered with blonde hair. Too much hair in my opinion, but then a guy's chest never did much for me anyway. Bring some sex-starved teenager up here though and she'd be all over Seaver Dillard of the Atlanta Dillards, owner since 1790 of Magnolia Plantation. This meant, of course, that the Dillards had owned slaves, and now, here in Buffalo, New York, above Charlie's Bar, Seaver slept in the same room as a black man. No wonder Seaver got such a kick out of it. Seaver stared at me. I stared back. I wore blue jeans, a black tank top, and a New York Yankees cap. I had brown hair that hung to my shoulders. My eyes were brown as well, and since the age of 13, I'd worn round, black, wire rim glasses. Shit, you're hot, Seaver said. I folded my arms beneath my breast and leaned against the door frame. Thanks, I guess. He pulled the can of beer out of the case and held it up. Care to join me? I accepted the beer and sat down on the couch. The case of beer between us. What are we celebrating? I pulled the tab and the can opened with a soft hiss. Ah, Seaver said, don't you just love that sound? He imitated the hiss. Apparently you do, he chuckled. All those pictures you take, he said, scratching the top of his head. What do you do with them? I sell them. To who? Newspapers and magazines? You can make real money doing that? Some. Not enough though, huh? That's why you bartend for Charlie. Yep. I took a drink of the beer, enjoying the smooth taste and the coolness as it traveled down my throat. Beer was, beer was one of man's finer inventions. Seaver slugged down the rest of his eighth beer and opened his ninth. I'm my father's biggest disappointment. Did you know that, Gwen? No. He nodded his head. Yep, without a doubt. You take my older brother Lawrence Joseph Dillard IV. He runs the Dillard Empire now. Shit, there's the plantation, which, by the way, isn't really a working plantation anymore. Now it's a tourist show place. Then there are some other businesses. Shipping's a big one, and tobacco. Let's not forget tobacco. He looked at me. Like you really give a shit. Actually, it's interesting. Bullshit! You drank more beer. Where'd you grow up? Lincoln Parkway, here in Buffalo. No shit! No shit! When Jilly told us you were moving in, she said you were from Chicago. I lived there for a little while. Did you like it? Not really. I don't like Atlanta, even though I grew up there. Not everyone likes where they grew up. Nobody would ever move if they did. No one would have jumped in those wagons and headed west. He grinned. You got a point there, Gwen. I grinned back at him. My sister went to Harvard, he said. She's a lawyer. Big shot business lawyer. I was supposed to go to Harvard too. Why didn't you? Because that's where I was supposed to go. Got ya. He laughed. You catch on quick. Thanks. He finished his ninth beer and opened his tenth. Does Jilly know you love her? I spit out the beer I had in my mouth. Let's face it, he went on. You do. You scream dyke, by the way. I brushed at the wet spots on my tank top, my heart thudding in my ears. So does she? No. He gazed at me for a moment, then said, You should tell her. I shook my head. She doesn't know I'm gay. Of course she does. She's got a brain in her head. I looked away. I looked down at the can of beer in my hands, clutched so hard that my knuckles were wet. He sighed. Whatever. She's straight, Seaver. His eyebrows shut up. You think so? I know so. He ran his hand through his hair. Well, that sucks. He took a drink of his beer. Unrequited love. He pointed the case of beer. That calls for us to get drunk together. Have another. 